Hello. In this video, we are going to look at another example of a Markov chain in continuous time. The particular chain we are going to look at is called the Poisson process, and so by the end of this video, you should be able to write out the transition graph and jump rate matrix for the Poisson process, and to derive and solve the chapman kolmogorov equations for the Poisson process. In order to understand the Poisson process, let's begin by understanding a real-life manifestation of this particular random process. In this case, I would like you to imagine that you are sat beside a single lane road counting the number of cars that go past. Obviously, the time at which cars pass is random, or at least subject to factors in their driver's lives that you cannot possibly understand. The number of cars that have passed by you at time t is thus a random variable. I would like you to now pause the video and draw a transition graph for this particular process. Hopefully you have paused the video and given yourself time to think about the problem. If you have though, and are still a bit stuck, here is a visualisation of the Poisson process which, remember, is the random process that we are going to use to describe our traffic stream. The fish at the top of the slides arrive according to a Poisson process. They thus arrive at random times, and the time between the arrival of each pair of fish is random. At any instant in time, at most one fish can pass by. This is like the road example, because if you read the question, it tells you that the road has only one lane which means only one car can pass by you at any given time. OK, with that clue in place, pause the video again and see if you can draw the transition graph. Hopefully you have drawn something like this. There are three important things to note about this graph. First of all, the number of cars that have passed you by can never decrease, so there are no connections that take you from some state k to some state n that is less than k. This fact ensures that all the states in the chain are transient. The second thing to note is that there are an infinite number of states in the chain, as there is no upper limit on the number of cars that can pass you by. Furthermore, the initial state is n equals 0, as when you first set up stall, zero cars will have passed you by. Lastly, the third thing to note about this chain is that each state k is connected to itself and the state k plus 1, as only one car can pass by at any instant in time because the road has only a single carriageway. With regards to point 3, there is an interesting and subtle caveat which is connected to the fact that we should perhaps not draw transition graphs for continuous time Markov chains. I like to do this, however, as I think these pictures help students to understand. The problem with drawing these transition graphs is that, there is that it possibly stretches the analogy between discrete time and continuous time Markov chains a little too far. If you remember, when we first learnt about transition graphs in the context of discrete time Markov chains, we said that the edges were used to indicate the transition probabilities. That is to say, the, the edges are used to represent the elements of the one-step transition probability matrix. If an edge was not drawn, it implied that the probability of a transition between those two particular state dates in one time step was zero. The problem for continuous time is that the elements of the transition probability matrix are no longer probabilities, i.e. real numbers. Instead, the elements of the transition probability matrix are functions with an explicit dependence on t. The reason this is important when it comes to drawing our transition graphs is that when we draw the graphs, we have to pick a value for t, as the edges are used to display the transition probabilities. That is to say, the transition graph is not used to illustrate the elements of the jump rate matrix Q, the matrix of limits which is defined as shown in the bottom of the slide. In the case shown here, I picked an infinitesimally small value for t. That is to say, the value of t that I choose represents an instant in time. 
The infinitesimal is important here, as for any t greater than zero, all the elements in the diagonal and above the diagonal of the transition matrix are greater than zero. All the elements below the diagonal, meanwhile, are equal to zero for all t, as transitions that move backwards through the chain are not allowed. What I am trying to get at here is that regardless of what happens for cases when t is greater than zero, in the limit of infinitely small time, the Poisson process assumes that many of the elements of the transition probability matrix, the ones that take me from state k to state k plus n, where n is greater than 1, tend to 0. This once again is, a, is connected to the fact that I am considering a single carriageway road, and that as such, two cars cannot pi, pass by in a single instant in time. This is important as it's one of the two assumptions that allows me to determine the jump rate matrix Q in this case. With this in mind, pause the video now and try to write out the jump rate matrix Q for this particular time, continuous time Markov chain. You perhaps wrote a jump rate matrix something like the one shown here. The elements along the diagonal are all equal to minus lambda, and the elements on the upper diagonal are all equal to lambda. We have already discussed why the matrix has this bi-diagonal bi -diagonal structure. Transitions that lower the number of cars that have passed by are forbidden, and in the limit of infinitesimal time, only a single car is allowed to pass. What I have not explained, however, is why all the k, k plus 1 elements, and by extension the k, k elements of this matrix are the same. The assumption we have made by making all these elements the same is that the arrivals of the cars are all independent. In other words, there is no correlation between the arrival times of the various cars. We have now introduced the conceptual framework for the Poisson process and discussed the assumptions that underlie this particular probabilistic model. A Poisson process can be used to model the number of events that have occurred by a time t. Furthermore, when using this model, we must assume that the events are equally likely to happen at all points in time, that is to say they're not periods during which it is more likely that events will occur, and we also have to assume that the individual events are uncorrelated. That is to say that the occurrence of one event does not make the occurrence of subsequent events more likely. With this framework in place, let's now move on and solve the Kolmogorov equation in order to get an expression for the probability that different number of events will have occurred. When we write out the matrices in the Kolmogorov equation explicitly, we get in a matrix equation like the one shown on this slide. Notice that each of the three matrices in this equation, the matrix of derivatives, dp by dt, the matrix of prob probabilities, p of t, and the jump rate matrix, q, are square, and that each of these matrix has an infinite number of rows and an infinite number of columns. Let's now calculate the derivative of dp0 of t by dt by performing the required matrix multiplication. Remember that p00 of t is a function that gives the probability that no events have occurred by time, by time t. Its position as the 0, 0 elements of the, in the matrix of derivatives on the left-hand side of the equation implies that we can calculate this derivative by multiplying the first row of p of t by the first column of q in accordance with the rules of matrix multiplication. When we perform this multiplication, we find that the resulting matrix product has only one term because all the elements in the first term of in the first column of q are zero except for the first element. We thus find that dp00 of t by dt is equal to minus lambda p00 of t as shown here. Let's now repeat this process to get an expression for dp01 of t by dt. Remember that dp01 of t is the probability that only one event has occurred by time t, and that because dp01 of t by dt appears in the 0, 1 element of the matrix of derivatives on the left-hand side, we can get this value by multiplying the first row of the matrix of probabilities by the second column of q on the right-hand side. 
Again, most of the elements of Q are equal to zero. There are in fact only two elements of Q that are non-zero in this column, and thus the matrix product we calculate has only two terms, as shown in the second differential equation on the slide. It turns out that these are the only two kinds of differential equations that we can get from this process of matrix multiplication. It is easy to show that the Poisson process is the solution to the following family of differential equations. I will leave that as an exercise for you to prove to yourself in your spare time, however. Let's now solve these differential equations. We will begin with the easiest one, which we have already seen how to solve in a previous video, on the exponential random variable. As we saw in that video, the first step is to rearrange the equation so that all the terms in P00 are on the left-hand side and all the terms in T are on the right-hand side. We then integrate both sides of the equation separately. At this stage, it is important to remember the boundary conditions. Remember that for a first-order differential equation like this one, we need one boundary condition. In this case, we'll use the fact that no events have occurred at the start time t equals 0. This ensures that p00 of 0 is equal to 1. This seems an eminently reasonable assumption to make, as at time t equals 0, that seems like a good time to start counting. We now integrate the left and right hand sides of the equation. The integral of 1 over p00 to p00 is the logarithm of p00, while the integral of minus lambda dt is minus lambda t. Substituting in the boundary conditions, we then have the following. Obviously, the logarithm of 1 is 0, and lambda multiplied by 0 is just 0. We thus have that the logarithm of p0, 0 of t is equal to minus lambda t. The final step involves taking the exponential of both sides to get p0, 0 of t is equal to e to the minus lambda t. In other words, the probability that no events occur by time t decays exponentially as t gets longer and longer. In other words, the likelihood that at least one event will have happened by time t increases as t gets larger. Let's now look at what happens in the case when n equals 1. From the earlier slide with the matrix equations, the differential equation to solve in this case is the one shown here. This type of differential equation can be solved using the integrating factor, as I will show in a moment. As in the previous simpler method, the first step in this approach is to get as many of the terms in P0, 1 of t onto the left-hand side and many of the terms in t onto the right-hand side as possible. In this case, we will do this by adding a factor of lambda p0, 1 of t to both sides. The next trick involves introducing the integrating factor. In this case, the integrating factor is e to the plus lambda t. What we do with this factor is we multiply all the terms in the equation by the integrating factor as shown here. For the time being, don't worry about how this factor was obtained. I will come back to how we determine the appropriate integrating factor in a later video on the inhomogeneous Poisson process. In the video, I want you to focus on the next but one step in the method, which is the most conceptually difficult. Before we get on to that difficult step, however, let's first simplify this equation somewhat. Remember from the previous slide that we worked out that p0, 0 of t is equal to e to the minus lambda t. We can exploit this now and insert this into the right-hand side of our equation. The right-hand side thus contains an e to the plus lambda t multiplied by an e to the minus lambda t, which is 1. The right-hand side thus becomes equal to lambda as e the e to the plus lambda t and the p0, 0 t terms cancel each other out. Right, now to the difficult stage. The left-hand side of the equation at the top of the slide is equal to the derivative of the product of e to the plus lambda t 
and P01 of T. This holds by virtue of the product rule. In fact, we introduced the integrating factor precisely so that we could exploit the product rule in this way as we, as we go about solving this differential equation. In order to convince yourself that this step is correct, I want you to pause the video now and differentiate this product of functions using the product rule. In other words, I want you to differentiate e to the plus lambda t times the, times the unknown function p01 of t. Hopefully, by performing the differentiation described above, you are now convinced that this step we have just taken is valid. Furthermore, you may now even be able to see how, the, how to proceed, as the differential equation we have arrived at looks remarkably like the variable separa separable equations we solved on the previous slide. To proceed, we therefore put all the terms in t on the right-hand side and all the terms in e to the lambda t p01 of t on the left. We then integrate as shown here. Notice that once again we are solving a first order differential equation and that we need a boundary condition. We can once again use the fact that we assume that no events have happened at time t equals zero, because that was the point we started counting. Because of this assumption, we know that p0 1 of t is equal to zero, as the probability that one event will have happened at t equals zero is equal to zero as no events have happened at this time. When we integrate both sides of the equation, we get the results shown here. Notice that the lower limits for both the integral on the right of hand side and the integral on the left hand side are equal to zero, so I have not shown them in this result. I have made my use of the boundary conditions explicit in the derivation, however, and so should you whenever you are asked to solve this type of problem. To finish, we multiply both factors, both sides, by a factor of e to the minus lambda t in order to move the final term in t from the left-hand side of the equation to the right-hand side. We thus find that the final result is p01 of t is equal to lambda t multiplied by e to the minus lambda t. We now have functions that allow us to calculate the probability that no events have happened by time t and the probability that exactly one event has happened by time t. Let's now turn to the probability that exactly two events have occurred by time t. As shown here, and as was discussed in a prior slide, the differential equation for p02 of t looks very similar to the one that we have just solved for p01 of t. So we should be able to use the integrating factor method that we have just used to solve for p01 of t. We can thus take this equation and rearrange it so that all the terms in p02 of t are on the left-hand side. Once again, we multiply all the terms by an integrating factor that is equal to e to the plus lambda t to get the following. Furthermore, we can insert the solution that we have just obtained for p01 of t into the right-hand side, just as we inserted the solution we obtained for p0,0 of t into the differential equation for p0,1 of t. We now once again exploit the product rule to simplify the left-hand side of the differential equation. As on the previous slide, pause the video at this stage to prove that the derivative of the product of functions shown in, on the equation at the centre of the slide is equal to the left-hand side of the equation shown at the top of the slide. We can now once again move all the terms in t to the right-hand side and integrate both sides. Furthermore, just as in the n equals 1 case, the boundary conditions we use to solve the differential equation in this case come about because we know that no events have occurred at time t equals 0, so p02 of t is equal to 0. When this integration is performed, we find that e to the plus lambda t p02 of t is equal to lambda squared t squared over 2, which we can rearrange to get the equation shown at the bottom right-hand side of the slide.
It is worth pausing at this point and looking at the three results we have derived thus far. We have the following expressions for p0,0 of t, p0,1 of t, and p0,2 of t. We would be right to conclude that there appears to be a pattern in these results, and that the probability that n events have occurred by time t is given by the following expression. Incidentally, if you are unconvinced by this result, there is an exercise on the website which will allow you to prove that this result holds in general. What we, arrived at, what we have arrived at here is an expression for the probability that exactly n events will have occurred by time t, given that zero events have occurred at time t equals zero, and given that the process is a Poisson process. This is not simply one function. It is rather a family of functions, the first five of which are plotted on this slide. The red line here shows p0,0, the probability that no events have occurred, as a function of time. The green line shows p0,1, p the probability that exactly one event has occurred as a function of time. The dark blue line shows p0,2, the probability that exactly two events have occurred as a function of time. The purple line shows p0,3, the probability that exactly three events have occurred as a function of time. And the light blue line shows p0,4, the probability that exactly four events have occurred as a function of time. Each of these curves peaks before decaying, as the probability of having had these small number of events decays as t increases. Let's now suppose that rather than wanting to know about the probability that n events have happened at time t, we want to know how many events occur by time t. We can also derive a probability mass function for this random variable using this expression. At time t, the number of events, capital N, that have occurred is a random variable taken from a Poisson distribution with parameter lambda t. To conclude then, the learning outcomes for, from this video were for you to be able to write out the transition graph and jump rate matrix for the Poisson process and for you to be able to derive and solve the Chapman Kolmogorov equations for the Poisson process. I have shown you how to do these things in this video, so make sure you can do them before moving on. This stuff is important as the Poisson random variable is an important stochastic process. As you will see in subsequent videos and exercises, it finds application in the study of many random processes, and furthermore, many of the more complex stochastic processes are derived by relaxing various assumptions in the derivations that this video has just demonstrated. Thank you for your attention.